welcome to this panel, everyone. It's uh, great to see a good, you know, a good group of people here. Um, my name is Joe Fletcher Saxon, and I've got the privilege of chairing this panel. Um, and this is a panel actually that's made up of further education lecturers specifically. I'm not sure if any of the other panels have just got FE, le I don't mean just FE lecturers, but you know what I mean, purely FE lecturers, and I think it's pretty special. Um, this morning, Lisa McKenzie started by defining class and defining the word academic, and I thought it was interesting for us in FE, because I think it's where we are as the working class is predominantly in FE, but we don't often talk about it. We don't, we don't, you know, class is not something in the forefront of our sort of daily conversations. And we often don't define ourselves as academics, but are passionate, passionately believe that we are, we are academics, we are scholars. So it's brilliant to be in this space with uh, three brilliant people today, although one's missed. Oh, here she is. She's not missing in action at all. She's here. Okay. So, um, we have got one person who had to drop out, Asma Ahmed. So big love to Asma, just in case um, she happens to be watching today. Um, so first up, uh, we have we have Stacey Salt. She's talking about social construct of academic versus vocational. Although I think she's sort of changed it a bit since the original title. Um, it's, a, it's been a privilege and a joy to watch Stacey's sort of professional and academic voice really kind of thrive this year. So it's a great way for her to end a brilliant year, really. She's part of the Joy FE Collective. She's an advanced practitioner. She's a business lecturer. She's a mum. She's entirely very, very busy. But we're glad she's here with us today to share her presentation. So I'm going to spotlight you, Stacey, and you can take it away. Hello everyone, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm very, very, very nervous. Okay, so um, yeah, like Joe said, I'm Stacey Sol. Um, I'm a tutor and advanced practitioner at, at a further education college in Oldham, where I've, I was born and I've grown up, never really moved away from it. Um, just to start with, um, Joe did in introduce my abstracts as the social construct of academic versus vocational. It's very much since I started trying to put it all together, taking a bit of a detour. Um, but I think with what I'm going to be talking about, it kind of is what happens in life and we're never on, on a straight journey. Um, and what I wanted to do was really put some context behind um, academic, um, the idea around vocational my my abstract very much talks about um when you know stu students get the GCSE grades and the directed you know to go to the academic side if they get their English and maths etc and if they don't they go to the vocational side um but things like that are still around today and it was very much like that for me as I was growing up um, and there was lots of reasons um, for that. And I'm going to talk you through kind of my life story and how I've got to where I am today. Um, so just a bit of background. So this is um, my grandma, my dad's mum, and that's my dad when he was younger. Um, grew up in Oldham um, on a council estate. Um, my dad had quite a hard life. Um, his, his dad wasn't around much when he was younger. Um, his mum um, actually met when he was younger um, someone from a, a black Caribbean background and in the 1950s um, this was very frowned upon. He's got two brothers um, who were from a, a, a black Caribbean background who were my uncles um, and he struggled with this um, for many years he was picked on for it um, and he was kind of seen as an outcast and so was his mum and then this is my mum's side so I've got my dad not my dad my granddad and my grandma um, and my, my grandma worked in a mill until she had children and then she didn't work at all and my granddad worked at somewhere called Avril's um, in Oldham um, and then my mum and dad met, obviously, um, and I will tell my story. So on this slide, um, I've got some pictures of me as a baby. Um, 
there's my mum, my dad, um, and this house that they're sat in was the house that I grew up in until I was 18. Um, I was born in 1983. Um, when I was born, my mum was a dinner lady and my dad worked in a factory and my dad worked in the same factory up until last year um, where they made cardboard boxes. Um, at the bottom here, I've got my grandma and my granddad. When my mum and dad was at work, um, I went to my gran and granddad's every day from being a baby. They looked after me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, even when I started school, I would go to their house after school and we'd have tea there. And they was a huge part of my life. I class my gran and granddad as, as my heroes when, when I was growing up. <clears throat> this is... It, it, I put this picture and I found it um, when I was searching through my photo albums and it was very much shows and um, kind of where I grew up. So this was taken from my back garden. Um, I grew up in Oldham. I've got two sisters. Um, and like I said, we grew up in the same house. We never moved. Um, and it was just a two bedroomed tourist house and um, which we did make into three because we was on top of each other. Um, but yeah, life was very normal for me. Um, everyone was part of a community where I grew up. All the mums and dads were friends with each other. Very much when I went to primary school, I went to Clarksfield Primary School. Um, everyone's mums and dads kind of had the same jobs and they were all friends and it was just normal. And I loved primary school, very happy. You can see from my face here, I was I was a dead happy kid. Um, loved, loved every minute of it. The school itself was um, a very diverse school. So we had, um, there was people from all different backgrounds. Um, and it was just normal for me, um, very much part of a community. Everyone was equal. Um, there was no judgment and the school was in my local area. However, when I was 11 um, and I had to go to secondary school, my mum was quite adamant that I went to a better school. Um, so I went to a school about 40 minutes on the bus. This is, is, is going to tell the story of why I've got these little um, pictures at the top of each slide. So when I went to secondary school, I went to Saddleworth School, um, a 40 minute bus drive. I hated every minute of secondary school. Um, if you was first on the bus or the sooner you got on the bus to school, the poorer you were. I was always first on the bus and I was last off the bus. I went to a secondary school where none of my friends went from primary school. Um, I, I always felt like I was in the background, kind of like I was in, invisible. I remember in the first few weeks of school and we um, had to talk about what our parents did. Imagine doing that now, we wouldn't do that. And we had to say um, where our parents were. I remember saying, oh, my dad works in a factory. Um, he makes cardboard boxes. And everyone laughed at me. And it was kind of a label that was put on me from, from that moment on. I never had um, the shoes, the clothes that they all had. And coming from a primary school where it was very much like a community to go into a school that was predominantly white, and where there was judgments put on you. And if you was quiet, the teachers didn't really take much notice of you either. I wasn't on any sports teams. I didn't go to dance classes. Um, I wasn't part of drama clubs. I just kept myself to myself. And, and because of that, we just kind of sat in the background. I was very, very quiet at school. Um, I had a stutter, um, which people, People laughed at. I remember having to read out of a book. They used to take it in turns and I had to say a name in this book and it just come out as a massive stutter and I was laughed at by everyone. And, and again, this was an, another label um, that was put against me. Um, I was also told by some girls in class who were classed as the more popular ones when I was about 14. They invited me to the birthday party. And the reason they invited me was because they said I had potential. I will remember that forever. Um, if someone said that to me now, 
um, in that in that situation, I tell them where to go. Um, but at the time, I thought, oh my god, you know, I could be fitting in here. However, I was still dead quiet, and I remember all these popular people standing around me in the playground. Well, it wasn't a playground; it's secondary in, in the yard. And they were all shouting at me, Stacey, speak, Stacey, speak. And I, I remember that. And it was awful. And it just meant that I just went even further within myself. I absolutely hated it. Didn't fit in. When it comes to choosing work experience, I wanted to go and do it in a school. And they sent me to a hairdresser's near where I lived. Didn't even want to do be a hairdresser. It was kind of like they were saying, because, you know, you don't stand out um you know that's where we'll select for you to go i was told i should do hairdressing at college as well i i i always felt like i was in a crowded place but felt really really lonely um and i couldn't wait to leave i really couldn't um when i was 14 just to make life more not as normal as everyone else's. Um, my mum left um, when I was 14 um, and everything did become so much harder. My dad brought us up on, on his own from me being 14. He worked shift work, so I had to help out at home. I had my younger sister, my older sister moved away. My dad is my absolute hero. He's taught me so much about um, my values and that things don't come easy in life. Um, to help out at home, I worked from being 14. We used to pay for my own bus fare. If I wanted something like a new coat, um, my dad would park by it, but I would pay him back a few pounds a week out of my wage. My mum leaving at the time, um, it, the school I went to, everybody had a mum. Everyone's mum was around. Um, for me, um, at the time, I thought, how how could my mum do something like this? What I know now is that my mum was having a very hard time on to the point where it was a nervous breakdown. Um, didn't know that at the time, now I do, because of just life struggles, financial worries. Um, and it, it was hard for her. And I, I don't hold that against her now. But at the time, I was never supported by school, never. Um, and that, then things started to go a bit downhill. I started to have a drink, I started smoking, I wagged a few days at school, but I still I still got my GCSEs. This, this is some pictures of my dad. This particular picture here is my dad's first daughter. She she died before um, I, I, I was born. Uh, my dad had a wife before my mum. That's something that he, my dad has always struggled with. And then these pictures here are just some, some family pictures and, and that's my little sister. Um, this slide is, is just showing like when I grew up with my dad, we, we used to have shit teas basically. We still have those days now. We have shit tea Thursday here. Well, most days are, are quite crap teas because we're so busy. But things like fish fingers, beans on waffles you know that's what we used to have tuna and pasta um if you went to school with a quick say bad god help you um when i was at school now I, I wouldn't really care back then i remember i did go to school with a quick save bag and yeah i i got picked on for that as well um when i left school i went to sixth form again i just didn't fit in no, I just didn't feel like I was accepted. I mean, there were people at the sixth farm who were getting cars for the bloody birthday and stuff. Um, and I was struggling to, to even, even pay for my bus fare to get to college. And it was hard. So I left the year after I went to Oldham College to do travel and tourism. Again, it was a financial struggle. It, it was the feeling of I don't fit in and I, I don't know how to kind of progress and focus on something for the future when I kind of really need to be earning my own money. So I, I worked in nightclubs, and then I went working for British Gas and I worked for Oldham Council. In 2008, I was made redundant and I lost everything. I had a daughter um, from, from a previous relationship. 
and I lost basically everything. I lost my house, I lost my car, everything. Um, and it was me starting all over again. That brought flashbacks to me um, of the struggles of growing up. Um, and it was bloody difficult. In, when I was 28, I decided to go back to university. This person down here is my lecturer, Dr. I, Dr. Dennis Iam Sakathy. Someone said, why don't you go uni? And I thought, I can't do that. So anyway, I went for the interview and my lecturer interviewed me and I said, I don't think I can do it. I really don't. And he said, well, why not? What, what makes you different that you can't do it? And that has always stuck with me, just always. So I went off to university and I got a first class honours degree in business management. Within that time, I got married. Um, I had my son, Isaac. And in my second year of uni, I was pregnant with baby Jude. And at 16 weeks, I lost him. And I could have given up. I wanted to give up. Um, his blankets are something I have around me a lot. Um, and I brought them here today because it's like my good luck charm. I really did think it that was going to hold me back, but it didn't. I just thought I've got to keep, I've been through so much in my life. Um, I can carry on. So I, I went, I stayed at the same university, did my PGCE. When I started my PGCE, I fell pregnant again um, with my little rainbow baby, Casper. It was a struggle for four years. We struggled financially. Um, God, the amount of times we had sausage casserole for tea and things like that. But we survived and we got by. And these are my three, well, I've got four children. I don't think I've ever said four children before out loud. Um, but I've got Casper, Isaac and Jasmine, um, who just inspire me every day. And something that is dead, dead important for me is that they understand where I come from. I tell them a lot about the struggles and you too will also have struggles and you've got to work through it. And then we've got baby Jude here um, as well. These are some things that I have just seen this morning and I just wanted to share them. Um, um, the Marcus Rashford quote, take pride in knowing that your struggle will play the biggest role in your purpose. Absolutely, absolutely. As a further education tutor in a very deprived town, in a college where it's so diverse, for me to be able to understand them, share some of my experiences with them, because it's so important with the different students. Um, and telling your story, I think is so, so important. And I don't think we tell it enough. The road to success is always under construction, absolutely, with me. Um, my kind of buzz journey and my road and, and the bus stop, I'm never getting off that bus because um, I'm always going to be on a journey. And that journey is not just going to be one road up a hill to, to some school in a very middle class area. I'm going to be going around roundabouts and I'm going to be going through crossroads. And do you know what? I never moved up that hill. Um, in fact, I went the other way and I'm still really, really happy right now. Um, we do have our demons, but those help me to kind of move forward. And I've become part of so many amazing communities in the last year. And God, 18 months ago, I would have never done anything like this. And now because of the people I've met and the experiences that people share have kind of helped me to think, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to talk about where you come from and that you've struggled. This this morning um, is a picture of a robin that I saw just outside. Um, and I've been told it's a sign that your loved ones are near. I do actually think it's my granddad. It could be baby Jude who just popped in to kind of wish me luck today. And then on this is just lots of things that have just inspired me that make me who I am today. Um, from everyone, from my dad, um, from my mum, from my sisters, 
they're just people who who have done so much for me as a person um and my children god my children um like this morning you know even my nine-year-old good luck for today mum because I made a point of saying what I was doing today to them and how important it is to to not be ashamed of, of where you come from and that you will have some battles in life. Um, and it's hard and it's hard and I've had to change so many things on, on my journey so far. And for me, my journey is never ending. There's lots of exciting things that can happen in the future. I don't know what they will be yet, but I know you, you make your own journey and my past has helped me to be brave. It's, it's helped to define who I am and it's someone who I'm proud to be. Um, I don't have any regrets. I've done some stupid things in my life um, and overcome it and experienced different things, but I've learned a lot and I would never change anything that I've done before. And it's important for me to, to share that with my children, but not only that, with like-minded people, people from the same kind of background, people in further education and people like yourselves. It's important that we keep speaking about it, um, about the struggles we've had because nothing is easy. And I'm one of them people, everything happens for a reason. Not everyone, you know, is given loads of privileges in life. And in a way, I'm glad I wasn't because I've helped to shape my own future. I've helped to shape my present. And that's what has helped me be where I am today. And that's everything, um, I think. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Stacey. Um, there's no specific questions, but there's just lots and lots of love for you in the chat, which you'll be able to go back, back through and, and take a look at that. Um, I think that bus became a really powerful kind of metaphor, didn't it, from our early conversation? Yeah. The the way, you know, everything that you've been through and the kind of journey that you're on, really. And can I just say, fish fingers and beans is the tea of champions. It's at least weekly in our household. Yes. So. And waffles, don't forget the waffles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what I'll do is I'll move on to the next person and then at the end, because we've got a bit of time, we can have all the whole panel back and then if there's any questions then from, you know, anybody for any member of the panel, that just might be easier. Okay, thanks, Stacey. Right, okay, so... Right, okay, so we've got uh, the original Derry girl now. Um, sharing her route to education. She's an advocate around all issues of neurodiversity. And in, in fact, if you've ever seen her take an organisation to task about issues of dyslexia, for example, it really is um, something to uh, see. So she's also a member of the Joy FE Collective, which was mentioned before when, when we introduced uh, Stacey. If you don't know what Joy FE is, you can check out the hashtag on Twitter. Um, you might spot Sinead releasing a weekly playlist through term time to keep us all upbeat and buoyant. She's an advanced practitioner. She's currently studying for her ATS, which is advanced teacher status. Um, she started her MA in September because she, uh, she's another one who's just, just not busy enough. Um, she's been in England for the past 16 years, but, but that Derry centre, that Derry girl in her has never left. And we're, we're, we're thrilled about that. So we're now going to welcome Sinead Blackledge. Yay! Don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you, Joe. I am very, very nervous. I'm just going to share my screen so you're just going to bear with me. Do you know what? This morning I had a full four and a half page script and I was going to read word for word because I was thinking of the term academic. And then I listened to Lisa's broadcast and I went, you know what? Fuck it. No, I'm going to be me. I've got a couple of bullet points, but I'm going to say my story from my words. So please bear with me. And as you can hear, I still have the Dairy accent. So um, if you ever watch a Dairy Girls TV program, you know exactly what my childhood was like. Um, and if you haven't, I truly, truly recommend it. 
so who am I and can be defined by labels I have three labels in my life that have made and shaped and who always have I am so growing up where I grew up um circumstances around my education and being a teacher now have shaped and who have made me who I am and the three labels that I stand by for today so I grew up in Derry or London Derry dependent upon which side of the water that you grew up on um I was very very working class family um my mum worked in shirt factories I started working at 13 uh, on a Saturday and a Sunday, had earned £40, had to put £20 into the house, as you do, you had to pay your keep. Um, there was a lot of troubles growing up. Um, I didn't think it was anything weird to have police that had uh, machine guns walking down the street every day, bomb scares. I thought that was the, that's how the world worked. Um, but little did I know um that that wasn't the norm and how things didn't actually go about um that also shaped uh my school my school my education that I went from you didn't have a choice of what school you went to it was what religion you were determined what school you went to no matter what where you wanted to go that was it and in my growing up one of the things that really as still has scars today is I come from a broken family and growing up nobody broke nobody's family broke up we were the first family in the whole like the whole state that everybody's like and all the stigma that went from it oh Sinead's from a broken family oh what's wrong with her oh her mum and dad split up yes I am the daughter of a full-blown alcoholic yes I am from a single parent family but you know what it pride and that's who I am and when I was growing up, there was no aspirational targets that were set for you. You literally had a list of do's and don'ts. Your do's were you kept your head underneath the radar. You went to school, uh, didn't care about your results. But what you don't do is you don't, you know, you don't bring the police to your door. You don't get pregnant and you don't mix with anybody from the other side of the water. We don't care whatever else you do in your life. That was it. So growing up, I felt a bit lost. Obviously, I had a bit loss of culture, a loss of family identity, a loss of who, you know, no targets, no things that were set for me. So I gravitated towards education and I felt, you know, accepted because I loved reading and I loved doing what I was doing. And but. I have a love-hate relationship with education because when I went to sit my first exam and I'll never forget it sitting there saying, and I, I to this day, I still have that image in my head of that white piece of paper. And I was in the front row because I was a first class nerd and still am and still proud of it to this day. Front row sitting in the exam hall. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I could not get down on a piece of paper what was in my head. And I'm like, what's going on? I know the answer to this, but I couldn't do it. There was something that I wanted to overcome. And I was just like, what's going on? And because this was your 11 plus, I don't even know if they do the 11 plus anymore <laughs> or you do it over here. You know, this determined, you know, which of the three Catholic schools that you went to growing up. And so I went to the Catholic school of, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know, nobody goes to Cairnhall. Yeah, but people don't go there. But, you know, I was like, what's wrong with me? I know I know the information. And, you know, looking back on it, it was dyslexia. And when I was first diagnosed with dyslexia, and even to this day, some people back home still have, what is dyslexia? No, you're just putting a label on something. You're just making an excuse. That's for lazy people. And I wish I hadn't known the term back then. I wish I could go back and educate people because all I got was you were thick. It took until my husband met me and said, Sinead, you're dyslexic. And me having to go into that 
me having to make, make my husband say, Sinead, you're dyslexic. Sinead, you need to do this. Stop saying you're thick. Led into like become, over becoming the obstacles that I have because of my dyslexia, or because of where I grew up, because I came from a broken family. There just seemed to be hurdles put in place. So when I failed my 11 plus, I went to Garn Hall High School back in the area. I don't even think it's there, it's still standing anymore. anymore. And I walked in on my first day and I remember my second period lesson was science. And they went, Sinead Gillespie? And I went, yeah. And they went, are you Caroline's sister? And I went, yeah. Get out of my class. We're not having people from your state in here. We're not having people from your family in here. And I walked out the door and I'm like, what the hell? All I did was actually say, I'm here, I'm present, and I'm going to register. So there was the preconceptions already made because my family was broken, because my family was from Gallia, because I had felt my 11 plus that of preconceptions of who I was on day one of my high school without even letting me give a chance. And I was like, no, do you know what? Screw you. You want to take me on? Good. Because do you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. And I did, you know, and I, you know, I worked my arse off. And unfortunately failed my GCSEs because uh, I didn't know I was dyslexic at the time. And I went back to the what was called the tech for the technical college and redid them again and script them because I'm that stubborn person as to say, you know what? No, I'm not taking this lying down. And then I went to college um, and did my A-levels and failed them the first year. And when I was about to go into my second year of my A-levels, I took my dog for a walk and basically came back six months later with a broken spine. A guy had uh, stolen a car, was drunk off his face, drugged off his face and drove it into me doing between 100 and 130 miles an hour. And I still remember to this day, the police lady said to me, well, if you'd been standing in the middle of the road, he would have missed you. And I felt like saying, so every time a car comes down the road in the morning, do you want me to stand in the middle of the road? And I remember my mum always telling me the story. It was the 12th of August and her birthday is the 13th. And she found me in the hospital by following the trail of blood in and said, and just as the doctor had said to me, we don't think you'll ever walk again because of where the car hit me on my back. And I rolled over and I said to my mum, Happy birthday, Mama, at midnight. And I said, I'm going to walk again. Nobody's going to stop me from doing it. Needless to say, I am walking, running. It's not, it's not happening. Um, so I went and did my, I thought, you know what, I'm finishing my A-levels. I'm going to go back. I'm doing it. And I did. I script my A-levels, but I got them. And I remember sitting on the stairs of results day, crying. And a, a building man, one of the builders came up to me and says, don't worry, love, don't worry, love. You'll get it next time. And I went, I went, no, I actually passed. I was crying through floods of tears because I had actually got through and I had passed. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I can do this. It gave me the spur of I was could still learn how to walk properly. I was going to, you know, get my qualification. Went, I can do this. And... Again, the troubles in Northern Ireland and things at the time, I thought to myself, do you know what? I want to be an independent person. I don't want to have a university determined what religion I am. So I came to England and did my qualifications. Went to a little town, I was at Manchester Bolton, where I met my husband and did my degree. Did my degree and again, thought do you know what I got a degree and I was proud of it and they went oh yeah you got a degree it's only a 2-2 but it doesn't matter and I went do you know what um, I did it and I'm proud of it went into um edu went into a job that I hated and saw all my friends going into teaching and I thought do you know what and it looks really really good but there's no way I can do that and my mate at the time said to me he says 
why because I was he- held to help on the mall gate of the teacher and she says the man she says Sinead what are you doing just, just do be a teacher because I was teaching karate I was teaching rounders I was teaching netball but anything I felt academic felt like too oh no the thick girl can't do that and so my husband said to me one day he lost the plot with me and Sinead stop saying you're thick you're not you're dyslexic and I just remember saying what the hell is that I wish you know I had known what it was back then I wish I had known growing up that what dyslexic was and even to this day as I said to you before people still think that dyslexia is an excuse they call me being lazy some people back home and I am working my ass off to change their mindsets for that but I got I filled out the application form and I became a teacher and again it is a label but it's one that I'm proud of and I work hard every day at it. And when I found my first teaching job, first teaching applica- um, interview, I remember my mentor at the time who was doing my PGC, PGD, and he said to me, Sinead, take your engagement ring off. I went, what? And he take your engagement ring off. And I went, why? He says, because when you go in for that interview, the person's going to ask you, when you plan on getting married and having kids? Because they're going to think when... Are they going to take time off because I'm a woman? I'm a working class woman who thinks that automatically this is what you know you do. And I'm like, no, I I'm proud to say that my choice is that I do not have children. I cannot have children as a result of my car accident. But nobody is ever going to put me down for something that I have. If I have an engagement ring or wedding ring, if I'm single, if I am straight, gay, bisexual, whatever. No one is ever going to pass judgment on me. So I went in and I kept my engagement ring on. And needless to say, I didn't get the job. And I said to myself, I don't want to work for somebody like that. Um, and then in my next job, uh, when, the, when I did get my first job, actually, I worked in a college in Bootle in Liverpool. And there was a lady there at the time, thankfully she's not there anymore, who tried to say that I was my accent was too aggressive and was I bullying her because of my accent of the way I spoke? And I'm like, this is my accent. And so someone made a comment of, so why don't you try and speak English and try to teach me the word, how do you say parliament and try to speak with an English accent? And I'm like, no, I am who I am. I am proud of who I am, where I am from. And my accent is part of who I am. And I thought, no, that's, and I'm going to stick to my guns and 16 coming up on 17 years later no I can easy can still hear it's still there and it's never going away and then when I went through all my dyslexia support once you know I was doing my PGD found out I was dyslexic that my stuff and then teaching changed my life and I every year I start my my academic year by telling my students that I am dyslexic, that there will be some spelling mistakes on the board. And I'm happy for you to say, look, Sinead, you spelled that wrong. Like, good, because that's a learning opportunity for me. And the, the amount of students that come to me and say, do you know what? I think I might be dyslexic. I don't, is, this, is this what dyslexia is? Because it's not talked about. It was like not talked about in high schools. It's not talked about here. And they feel that it's something negative and they feel that it is something that they should hide. And I'm like, no, no student is ever going to go through thinking that they are thick in my class. No student is going to feel the way I felt going through education, not a chance, not on my watch. And it is not fair that that some students do feel like that. So I give handouts in different colors every day just for, bring everybody inclusivity in onto it. I talk to my students about dyslexia and, you know, we have open conversations about different things. And I always say to them, and I always show them a clip of uh, Dairy Girls now, thankfully Channel 4 has <laughs> embraced it, but where I come from. And students say, you came from there and you're standing in front of us today. I'm like, yes, I am. And it gives them a thing that, you know, oh my God, I can do it. I'm like, if anybody can do it, you know, if I can come from the roughest part of Derry where 
police were, I didn't know where police were army with machine guns. And I can stand in front of you now, then, and then anybody can do anything they want in this life. Your only person stopping you is you. And here, the quote that I always have is, I am dyslexic. My brain works differently. And that's amazing. And I am proud of it. I am proud to be dyslexic. I am proud to be different. And I say this with so much passion. And I'm doing, in the last 12, 18 months, I have had the best couple of years. Um, about four or five years ago, I became, about four years ago, I became an advanced practitioner at college, which means I get to help people. I get to support people. I'm doing my advanced teacher status. You know, and with that, I've had to have a few challenges and but knocking a few bridges down on the way, but getting there. And little old me, little old me from Gerda is starting my master's qualification in September. Me, who struggled to pass one exam, is going for a master's. And hopefully I have a goal set for myself. By the time I'm 45, I want to start my PhD. And that is where I'm going to be. So dyslexia, where you come from and wherever your surroundings are, make part of you, but it makes the best part of you and be proud of where you're from. So I think I am one minute over, Joe, so I do apologize. <laughs> no apology needed. Okay, you can uh, stop sharing. Du -du -du -du. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There is um, loads of love in the chat for you. There are a couple of questions and there are going back to Stacey as well. But what I'll do is, uh, look, there's people clapping there in case you can't see. Um, I will, I'll bring you us all back together at the end and you can just have a moment. Okay. Um, which I think might just be easier to go through everything all at the end. Right. Okay. Mike. Are you ready? <laughs> I'll just do a bit of an intro. So. Mike is actually in a minute, he's going to be sharing a film um, rather than talking um, just now, although he's obviously around for any questions. So Mike Scott, he is a military veteran. He's a dad. And unbelievably, Mike, you're a granddad as well, aren't you? I nearly fell off my chair when I realised that. Um, he's a newly qualified um, lecturer within further education. He's a PhD candidate. He's an advocate for, again, all things neurodiversity. Um, he, he's going to share with us things about his working class background, but also his journey through education as a, as a mature student. And the title of this film is um, seeing the unseen um, and you'll be able to ask questions of Mike about it after we've all shared it. Hello everyone, thank you for being here today. I am currently recording this session in advance. However, I hope to be there in chat with you. So we begin at the end of a current chapter. Still me, still unseen but a little bit less, still 100% working class, I'm working through life's journey. As a mature student, I've undertaken back-to-back -back adult education and higher education courses since 2010. I'm currently just completing my PGCE, which I did with the college I now work for in the northwest of England. I don't like the title lecturer. To lecture someone sounds authorial. I much prefer practitioner, which I find is a middle ground between teaching and practicing your subject specialism. I have been working with ALS learners that's learners that need additional help with their studies and finding strategies to overcome their learning barriers. My long-term goal, 
now is to start my doctorate in education where I will be researching hybrid learning through virtual learning environments to bring equity into the classroom on the BTEC media course. School and I didn't always get along. I was often stated to be a shy, studious individual that was not academically gifted. My, rec my report cards would say the same thing over and over again. My background isn't what I call working class, even below working class. My mother didn't even work. And as a single parent family, we didn't have access to a lot of things. This included the quality of education I received. The school was a typical one. It had a lack of funds and teachers would set work and that's about it. I just got lost in the system. What is happening today in some ways is a repeat of the past just with different nuances to it. I joined the Navy at 17 as a Marine engineer. At 18, I suffered a serious head injury, which resulted in being medically retired honorably. And this led to not knowing my place in society, not having an identity, having trouble finding work, and having issues in both my professional and personal relationships. I struggled to explain my emotions or even identifying the emotions that I was experiencing at the time. Because of this, I suffered a lot of mental health problems and attempted suicide twice during a 10 year period. This resulted in moving to the Northwest for a fresh start. I tried to find work up here in the Northwest, but it was a struggle. I had experience and a qualification in engineering, but I couldn't use it due to my disability. I was in a catch-22 with the job center as I was too smart for their work coach courses, but I could not find a job independently either. Weeks turned into months and months turned into two years before I decided to try college evening classes. During this time, I was getting help and support for my mental health. One evening led to me discussing doing a university course as a mature student. As a mature student, I have completed two degrees and a postgraduate in education. As I've mentioned at the start of this talk, I will continue for the next five or six years on an education doctorate in creative media. I currently think if I work hard and continue to engage in learning, then I see no reason as to why I cannot become a professor one day. Who knows? I might not be the smartest, nor affluent person, and I may talk in a common dialect, or perhaps the way in which I present myself is being misinformed by society. But I think it's up to myself and others to change the narrative. And even in a small way, I have managed to question you're thinking, then I am happy. I'd like to present now my short microfilm I created as a thinking piece for my MA in film. This is the first time this has been shown to an audience outside of the university. I'd like you to see through my eyes and my thoughts as I take a journey and so without any more from me, I present seeing the unseen.
When I leave my sanctuary, I am often wary. I avoid the glances and stares. Why should I care? Sometimes I feel lonely. Do you see the person I see? Am I truly on my own? Why am I viewed in a negative light? Why must there be a mental fight just to feel I exist? Is it possible for you to care? Treat me as an equal instead of laughing behind my back. Does my physical presence, my mobile frame, disturb your morales, morales that you sorely lack? Because of this, I'm in a constant state. I stress, I cry, and often in the night when it's late. I will go back to my sanctuary, the place that I go unseen, the place that locks me away for another day. Hope you'll finally understand the pain, the grief I must withstand. To count as a human being, I must go on as stubbornly as I can. Just for once, stop and look at me, to my face, please don't let me go, unsee. Thank you to everyone for listening and feel free to drop comments into the chat and I will do my best to answer them. That's it. So question time now. Yeah, if, if um, Sinead and Stacey, if you want to rejoin. That's, and then, yeah, great. Okay, so I have got a couple of um, questions. If we go back to Stacey. Um, and it's Alex saying, thank you for an amazing presentation. I, she's been influenced by Antonia Dada, who reminds us that our emotions and feelings are an important part of our intelligence and education. How do you think feelings and emotions are important in education? It's all about empathy, isn't it? And, and I think because I've worked with so many students, not just students, staff as well, um, from all different backgrounds, all different experiences, um, because I've felt over the years since since being a kid, um, lots of different emotions um, from being invisible, um, from having the pain of losing a child, um, from having the pain of coming from a broken family, the pain of my, my granddad dying, um, things that mean so much, I think, it, it gives you an open mind um, to other people's situations with without necessarily being judgmental. When, when I was at school, and I think I mentioned it before, when, when um, my mum left, no one was understanding of that at school. Um, there was no support at all. Um, but that, for a 14-year-old child, was a massive change it it flipped my life upside down basically um when I went to sixth form college that's when my granddad died again there wasn't that understanding there was no support that's that's why I ended up leaving sixth form because I was taking time off and, and got and I, I was kind of left behind um blamed myself a lot for that um and I think as an educator it's important that we understand where students come from. And even if it's a student, I mean, I've worked with, with adults as well. And I've talked about this before. Sometimes an, an adult might not be able to come into college for their class because there's no one to have the children or they don't have enough bus fare. Um, 
and they're just struggling to get there. They might have been up all night with the kids crying. And I've been there. I've been in that situation. And for me as an educator, there's no way I'm going to say, you need to get yourself into college. Now, you understand that. And and you make changes um, that will help them. You support them. You don't just kind of think everyone is the same because we're not. We're not. We go through different struggles. I'm a strong believer in, like, in a morning, like, if you go to the shop or something, say good morning to people. Um, I had it on, on one of my Facebook statuses the other week. And just things like that can absolutely change a person's day. Um and it's nice, but being emotionally intelligent as an educator, I think, is one of the main things that you need to have. You, 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 you need to know that your students are going to come into college and something may have happened. It could have been that they split up with the girlfriend or the boyfriend. Um, so they're still going to be upset by that. They could be coming from a home where there's been a massive argument in the morning um, between siblings or between parents. Again, that's going to affect their day. That's going to affect their time at the college. So it's so important and it's so valuable. And it's one of the key things that I think is needed as an educator. Thank you. Um, Stacey mentioned there about having worked with adults and she's written something for the Adult Conversations campaign, which much earlier went in the chat, I did share a link for, so I think people might be interested to take a look at that. Um, okay, Sinead, a couple of comments and then a question. Um, so Julie says, FE has been a journey in finding loopholes to make courses accessible. And Julie O, I can see you, Julie O. Ovington in the chat there a lot. Um, she just says, disrupt the norm, the normative and dominant ways of doing education. She was just, you know, kind of applauding the kind of things you were saying. And Jay says, hard relate to the notion of lazy. But here's a question uh, from Kevin. Um, it seems as you were describing how you felt about doing things as an adult, which you viewed as academic, you tended to steer away from. Why was this? Were you fearful of being exposed? Your experiences are far more valuable beyond any classroom wall. So it's that thing about steering away from the academic. Why did you and were you fearful? I think for me, it's two parts. I think growing up I was in a you're always scared for labels and you're always scared for being thick and the academic side of you sort of scared the life out of me so maybe I did sort of fear away from it for a long time but maybe I must understand the question but maybe I'm thinking about from an emotional side of you and supportive side of you for students as well I do think it is, it is important to have, yes, you know, I didn't, I just, did I steer away from the academic side of you? I don't know. Um, feeling exposed, definitely. Um, experiences are valuable on the classroom wall. There are so many experiences, as Stacey was saying, that our students are experiencing and I think the fact that you can bring your experiences into the classroom is very vital and is very important because if it is the dyslexia if it is growing up from a broken family if it is growing up in a deprived area teaching those class those experiences you know students see that you're human they don't see that they're academic um and I always I teach finance at the moment I teach finance and I always, the, the kids, a kid a few years ago said to me, Sinead, why do they actually make it sound harder than it is? Why do they use these big, awful, stupid words when they can say common words? And I find education in that way that sometimes it feels like, and I may speak out of turn, so apologize if I do, that it is a upper class white man who has done education and are trying to exclude 
working class people and people who feel you know with these big big words and they're trying to exclude people because of these big words and I teach by saying okay this is the academic term but this is what it means for us normal people and I say I must say that at least once or twice a week I say this is what it means for us normal people this is the authentic this is what the meaning of this word and I also have the conversations why does this and I'm like well, I'm breaking down these academic walls. I'm breaking down these barriers to what people ac- think that academic people actually are. And I'm like, and for me, yes, I have bring all of that in and I break down the academic walls in so many ways in the classroom, out of the classroom, because it's important for kids to know that they can do it, no matter what their background is. Yeah, and actually, um, connected to what you're saying, there's comments are coming up. I can see about authenticity and and so on. And again, Julie, Julie Armington saying, um, not only do we need to see students, they need to see us. And I thought that was uh, very much, you know, connected with what you were saying there. So thanks, Sinead. Um, Mike. Okay, I've um, you'll have seen there's lots of comments and, and, you know, lots of applause and, and great stuff in the chat about, you know, both your presentation and, and your very powerful film. I've got one uh, question here for you and it's from Lucy. Uh, Lucy so hi, Lucy Harding. Um, Mike, do you find spaces such as Twitter empowering as people perhaps see you before they see the disabilities? How can we enable this empowerment in spaces such as colleges? Mm. So there's two parts to that question. So yeah. the first part, I would say yes to the Twitter space because if it wasn't for the particular edgy, edgy Twitter, um, I wouldn't be here today speaking on this panel, speak, you know. Um, just because of the way I speak and the way I think. Um, it's like a double-edged sword to that. Um, sometimes they see the white person, <laughs> you know, a white male. Um, so there's that. I always feel that, uh, you know, um, people might get the wrong impression, you know, first looks and everything like that. And the way I sound and the way I speak as well. So having a space like Twitter, which is mostly text-based, is is quite empowering because not only can you follow people that you're interested in, um, but you can also sort of build up a network of people that can inspire you to push yourself further. And I think that's what the space has done for me. And in much so in the sense that I want to pay that back as well. Um, So that's the first part of the question. The second part is, um, I'm not too sure with the, so like for the students and stuff uh, with with Twitter, um, because we're always saying, uh, be careful, of what you post on on Twitter and, you know, on social media and things like that. But I think, so teaching during the COVID um, pandemic, we used a lot of um, Microsoft Teams. And I know it's not quite the same as Twitter because Twitter is an open space. You know, anyone can view anyone's um, comments whereas Microsoft Teams is just purely college restrictive so in that sense it is a safe space to be posting stuff and communication with each other and I think it's truly a good space as in a first step to sort of exploring and sharing each other's um, viewpoints and sort of discussing without um, making assumptions because I think when you're stood in front of your class as an educator or as a student people get that first impression and it's not always necessarily the right first impression 
So I think things like Microsoft Teams helps build up your identity and, and share your experiences without so much the judgment and stuff like that. So yeah, hope that answers <laughs> that question. Thank you, thank you. Again, it's more probably lots of comments um, rather than necessarily questions. Um, I just thought perhaps we could end by telling us a bit about next steps for you all, because I know at least two, possibly three of you are going on to study, uh, looking at researching things. So do you want to share a bit about that? Sinead, what are you off to now? What are you doing next? What's your next big challenge? Uh, next big challenge is getting my ATS finished. <laughs> um, so that is handed in in October with my Viva in January for that. And just because, as you said, Joe, I haven't got enough to do, I have decided to start my master's in September, um, which is delivered at University Campus Oldham through University of Huddersfield. And it is quite nerve wracking because it's a full academic thing going back into the classroom again. And being that, and this will be, besides my PGD, this is the first time that I will be undertaking education diagnosed as dyslexia with dyslexia sorry so this is the first time I feel like I can probably give it a proper go do you know what I mean to see what I'm actually going to be truly valued at um myself and Stacey are working on a project in regards to um vocational pathways so we're putting we're in the early stages of putting together communities of practice for vocational subjects as well. So not just English, maths, all the other subjects they come together with. Uh, doing the Joy FE Constellation project, AP Connect Four, which has just started as well. So big up Joy FE and AP Connect. Um, and I just adopted a little 11 week old puppy who finally has slept through this whole procedure. I'm so happy that she isn't climbing all over me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, the only reason I'm asking, because it's this thing about being seen. And I just think you really are being seen, aren't you, this, uh, particularly this past year. Um, Mike, what, what's your um, PhD focus? So mine is the only one of its kind in the country i believe where it's a doctorate of education but it has the caveat of having creative and media which is my subject specialism so it blends education and creative and media together um so i will be looking at fe in particular als students and sort of using them virtual learning environments to improve and and use of differentiation and those high expectations in the classroom so using it as a a bridging tool for those that think differently um so that's what i want to do with the doctorate um research for my own personal growth i am writing for inspire fe um about uh, the uh, flipping the classroom because I thought it was a useful technique I used during uh, this year where we've had the COVID-19 I found it a lot better so in combination with that virtual learning environment I want to see if flipping the classroom in with the use of say Microsoft Teams and and sort of compare the results to that um also, just doing what I've been doing, uh, attending more conferences and, and being encouraged to uh, speak more in, in such conferences um, and just keeping an eye out on, as Lou said, the Effie, so edgy Twitter. I've appeared on a podcast already, which was good. Uh, and just I've been doing sort of in-house stuff with the college that I work for which has been encouraging they've asked me to write another journal piece for their in-house journal and this one will be on superpowers so uh, neurodiversity so I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing that soon 
Thank you. Um, so if anybody wants to catch you on that podcast, it's called Universal Learning, isn't it? So that's worth finding that particular podcast. And then to, to round us off here, Stacey, next big, I mean, it's half of them are with Sinead, as she's already said, but <laughs> what, 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 are the, what are the next steps for you getting your voice out there? Um, well, yes, yeah, so, so some of what Sinead said, because we do work in the same college, but we're friends outside of college, um, very good friends, and, and we do like... To, to work on little projects together. So yeah, um, we're hopefully starting the communities of practice for vocational courses. Um, I'm gonna, I've been working on a podcast um, with my colleague Eve Shepherd um, for, God, it's been ages now, um, quite a few months. Um, we're recording our last episode of series one today. Um, and then in September, we're hoping to bring out series two, well, no, we are bringing out series two, um, which is going to um, link in a lot more with the student voice. Um, but what we really want to do with the podcast is is get people externally as well so we can share that within the college, um, kind of bringing the outward in and taking the inward outward, etc. cetera. Um, I started some work on command verbs not, not long back, um, so I really want to carry on with that and um, it sounds dead simple but um with the reading i've done and stuff like that i think a lot of it comes down to things like culture capital so i think and poverty and i really want to make that link between that side of it and students understanding and be, being able to complete the different command verbs that they find in assignments um, of course ap connect um it's it's part of our life. It's our hobby. We absolutely love it. Um, so we've been, I'm starting Constellation C for AP Connect 4 in September. Dead excited for that. Um, for that, we'll be working on a project, um, but there's lots of other strands to it, and it, it's just amazing. I want to carry on with writing. I've had a bit of a break from it because um, my head has just gone the last few months, um, but I really want to get back into my writing again because it just makes me happy. Um, and the final thing is that... <laughs> I'm torn between if I'm going to do my master's in education or the EDD. I did decide, then I undecided, and then I decided and undecided. I still, I can't make a decision, but I need to hurry up because it's nearly September. So either way, I will be doing something academic from September, fingers crossed. Um, and that's me really, just carrying on working, connecting with people. It's only a short list. Stacey, isn't it? I mean, it's <laughs> they, can, it's, they kind of just all feed into each other in a way, you know. The, yeah. But it's what we like doing, don't we? <laughs> we do. We do. Um, so, a few things were mentioned there um, that probably should say AP Connect, it's advanced practitioners, isn't it? Which are a, a kind of, well, we call, well, Lou's popped up on the screen, the, 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 the engine house, don't we call them, the driving force, the engine house, something like a change in FE. If people are not familiar with that. Few podcasts have been mentioned there, universal learning, but also Stacey didn't say the name of her own there. Let's get digital. Um, we've gone podcasting mad in FE, haven't we, over the last year, which is interesting in itself because I think it's part of that that about re reclaiming a voice thing. So look, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna round things off. We're gonna round things off a bit early in this in this panel because of course our lovely asthma uh, stepped down. But Lou, you've popped up on the screen. Did you want to say something? Well, only when you finished, um, Alex has asked me if I'd just close us down a bit for lunch. Anything more that you want to say, Joe? No, 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 no. We're closing early. Yeah. Fantastic. So we'll keep those podcast links coming in the chat in various places, um, folks, because as Joe said, there's been some amazing stuff, including Joe's own podcasts, um, which also includes a mini series um, for this conference as well. Big round of applause to you all. You've all been brilliant. It's also nerve wracking being a, a panel chair. So I'm just saying big love to you too, Joe. And I'm really missing the Zoom emojis this morning. We're going to break now for lunch. But before we do, just in case you've not spotted it, we have merch. 
beautiful t-shirts with um, one of Peter Shuki's paintings on. It says Working Class Academics Conference 2021. And for those of you familiar with your Miles Horton and Paolo Freire, it says, um, well, actually, this is Antonio Mercado, so I've got it wrong. We, we make the road by working, walking. We make the road by walking and working. Let's, let's face it, graft is part of it. So we've got mugs, we've got T-shirts, we've got those fancy little tote bags. At the minute, you can see them all on the website. And at the minute, I think if I'm right, Alex, um, you can't pay for them online. You order them via the email and there must be a gazillion little elves at the Shuki household getting ready to send those out. So yeah, buy the merch. The reason we've got merch is because it's lovely, but also because we all do this as volunteers. This conference happens because of the absolute graft of Alex and Peter Shuki and all the volunteer team and all the presenters who do it for nothing. And we did ask for donations this year because you would be astounded by how much this fancy webinar Zoom costs. So we've covered the Zoom costs, I'm pretty sure, which is fantastic. The merch really helps and helps the conference happening year after year. So go get some lunch, get some fresh air. Two strands open again this afternoon on the same links and we will see you back at 1.50 or 10 to 2, depending on your parlance. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Sinead. Thanks, Joe. And lots of love to Asma if you're here. Thank you, everyone.